Hello, it's Keith here and this is lesson one of the platform specific series of my 8086 programming tutorials. We're going to be looking at bitmap graphics today in CGA on MS-DOS. And in this series, we're going to be looking at one common piece of code of my simple Hello World example that will show a software sprite onto the screen. And it will do this on the CGA DOS machine, EGA DOS machine, VGA DOS machine, and also the Wonderswan black and white and Wonderswan color. So it, it's one piece of common code with a few modules. Um, there's a few slight tweaks here and there, but we're going to go through this example and we're going to look at how each system works differently with regards to calculating screen locations, transferring data to the bitmap screen and also generally about what the layout of that screen is for creating your own graphics and getting them onto the screen. So hopefully this will be useful to you if you're using assembly and you're trying to use DOS. Now today we'll be looking at CGA but we'll be going to EGA VGA later on so hopefully you'll stick around for those. Okay anyway let's go over to today's example and let's actually see in action. Okay, so this is the multi-platform Hello World here. So this will compile onto any of the systems in my tutorial. You can see there's some branching code here just for the different systems because there are a few quirks of the layout of the machines that we will be discussing. So today we're going to be just looking at CGA and you can see here we've got a nice Yokobiko character who's in rather strange colors here because of the CGA palette. Now personally I grew up on a CGA DOS machine, uh, it was one of my first machines for the first PC certainly. Uh, we only had a black and white screen though so I used to sort of um, see the colors on other people's machines that were much newer and I was sort of a bit amazed by the colors and I do have a fondness for the rather strange CGA palette so that's why I was very happy to do this tutorial. Okay so that's what we're going to be creating today. Now the code we're going to be looking at today is um, based on this and we've got basically the screen initialization, the turning on of the graphic screen, we're moving from text screen of course, and then we've got this loop here. Now this loop here is what's going to transfer the bitmap graphics for the DOS machine. Now in each case we're going to calculate the memory address of the first part of the screen and then we're going to transfer some bright bytes depending on the screen resolution. We're going to have to do 12 bytes for our 48 pixel wide image for the CGA machine. There are four pixels per byte because it's a four color that's two bit per pixel. And so that's what we've got to do there. Then we're going to transfer our bitmap example. We're including a file, which we've got just here. I will tell you how you can make your own file. So if you've got a graphic you want to use, I'll show you how. So we're declaring the width and storing that in CH. We're then calculating an X and Y position here in BH and BL. And we're using the function, which we're going to go over, get screen pause, which will convert that X, Y position into a memory address that we can write to and write to it we will. And what we're doing here is we're using move SB, move string byte, to transfer from DSSI to ESDI. And ESDI is being calculated by the get screen pause function just here. So that allows us to transfer one line of our sprite from bitmap test to the screen. And then once we've done a line, what we're doing next is we're using this get screen next line function, which is calculating the logical next line of the screen. Now that might be in a different memory position depending on our system. So that function is going to work that all out for us. And then we're just repeating back up to the top here and transferring the next line again. So this function here will work for all the DOS machines, irrespective of the screen mode. You can see the EGA has a little bit of trickery going on there, but the CGA and VGA are basically the same. So this common routine will do the work for all of the systems. But what we're going to look at today is the CGA. OK, and here it is. So this is the code that's handling the CGA specific graphics. So first of all, we've got a screen init routine here, and this is going to turn on the graphics mode. Now we're using BIOS interrupt calls just for the initialization of the screen. I'm not a fan of using system calls. I prefer to go straight to hardware, but in this case, it seemed more appropriate. So once we've got the screen on, we're going to do everything using memory locations. But to turn the screen on, we're going to use the system calls here. So we're selecting our screen mode here. We're using interrupt 10. We're using function 0 here, which is set screen mode, and AL will be the mode. We're using mode 4, CGA 320 by 204 color. So that's selecting the screen mode and turning it on. Then we're selecting our colors. Now we've got two possible palettes. We've got the warm color palette, which is red, green, and yellow, or the cool color palette, which is cyan, magenta, and white. Now we've got this set to one here. So we had the cool color palette, which you saw just a moment ago, which is that. There it is. So those are the cool colors, which are my personal favorite. Those are the sort of um, traditional colors, if you will. But if we change this to a zero here and we compile again, 
Well, now we have the rather strange yellow, green, red palette here. So, you know, if you want that, you can use that. Now we select the color palette again with interrupt 10. We need to use function B this time, and we need to select the BH as one in both cases, but BL is either one or zero to select the two of those palettes. Now, as well as a color palette, we can have a brightness again with function B of interrupt 10, but this time we have to set H to zero here, and we either set the BL to 10 or zero. Now, 10 is high intensity, which is what you just saw. If we set it to zero and we run again, well, everything will be just a little bit darker. And of course, this works with both the warm palette or my preferred cool palette. So if we just say change this back to a one here and compile again, well, there we've got a, a, a nice uh, sort of gray and some nice pinks and um, blues there. So we, we do have a little bit of color options with the CGA, but as I say, for, for me, CGA is always going to be this very extreme color palette here. This is what I think of when I see CGA. So that's, that's what I like. Okay, so that's how we turn our screen on and how we use our choices of colors as we want to. Now, we need to understand how the CGA screen works. Now, the CGA screen, we need to set the ES register to B800, which is the start address of the screen within the addressable memory range. Now, what we need to do then is we need to actually understand the physical layout of the screen. Now, the screen is 320 pixels wide and each byte contains four pixels. So the screen is effectively 80 bytes wide. Now, the trick with the CGA screen that may catch us out is the lines don't quite come after each other in memory. They're not as crazy as a system like the Amstrad CPC or the Spectrum, but they are interlaced. So every other line is below the first one in memory. So lines one, three, five, and seven are after each other in memory, but the alternate lines zero, two, four, six, and so on, they're at a different memory address and they actually appear hexadecimal 2000 down in memory from the first set of lines. So there's these two banks that make up the alternate lines of the screen. And so we're gonna have to cope with that. Now that's what we do. So what we're doing here is we're getting our X position and our Y position. Now our X position is just an offset in our memory address. Now our Y position, we need to take all but the bottom bit here and we need to multiply that by 80 because that's 80 bytes wide divided by two. And that's because every other line is consecutive. So the alternate lines are in a completely different position. So we're effectively halving the Y position and then multiplying by 80 with this multiplication here. Now, as I say, those alternate lines are in a completely different memory position. And the way we deal with those is we have to effectively add in hexadecimal 2000 if the bottom bit is one. And that's why we're doing an and of that Y position just here. And if that is non-zero, if we're on an odd line, we're actually adding hexadecimal 2000 by this XOR here. And that will move down to that alternate bank for the alternate lines if that's where our sprite is starting. Now, the screen base, as I say, is B800, and we're loading that into ES. DI, at the end of all of this, will have the Y position multiplied by 80 plus the offset if needed. The X position will be added as well, and that will give us the final address for the start of the image. And we were using that, of course, just here. And if the effect of using this is we just set BH and BL to a position offset and get screen pods will do the work for us. Now, we of course need to move down a line once we've drawn each line of our sprite. Now, this is relatively easy, but we do again have to deal with that offset. So what we're doing is we're taking in the current address and we're seeing if we're already on that odd line. If we're not, then what we're doing is we're skipping over this next line and we're XORing hexadecimal 2000, essentially moving us into that second bank. If we are, then we are actually going to need to move back to the first bank and we need to go and move and we're going to need to move down a line, which is 80 bytes. So we're adding 80 to the current position, and then we're XORing again, moving out of that second bank back into the first bank, because of course, every time this XOR occurs, we will flip between the two banks. So that's why we're doing that just here. So this will effectively deal with the moving down of a line, whether we're on the odd or the even line, and it will return DI to continue pointing to the next line of our sprite. Now, that's what, of course, we're doing just here. And that's how we're able to draw the graphic to the screen. 
and all the lines are filled in despite the fact that every alternate line is in a different memory position. Now I will just intentionally break my code uh, like some crazy fool here. If I rem out this line here and remove the XOR, well what will happen now is it will actually mess up every other line. So now we no longer have the code that's correctly moving down the lines. So you can see here now that the image has become stretched out and it's become interlaced because it's no longer moving to the alternate bank every other line. So I just trying to make the point there of the interlacing effect of that alternate bank, a hexadecimal 2000. So there we go. So we definitely want to undo that mistake there. But that's the basics of getting CGA graphics onto the screen. Now, I know what you're probably thinking, and where can I get CGA graphics? Now, of course, you could create them in bytes. The format is relatively straightforward. It's just, um, as I say, two bits per pixel. But if you want to be able to export an image you've already got, then you're welcome to use my Acrosprite editor. It's free, it's open source. You can do whatever you want with it. It's a C-sharp application. Uh, it's included in the dev tools if you've downloaded them. And all you need to do is load up an image like this one, which I've included in the file. And when you go to the 8086 menu, x86, sorry, and MS-DOS, you've got save raw bitmap CGA. And as long as your image is in the correct format with the four colors here, it will export just fine. And then you can include your own image into the code that we've looked at today. You would just need to basically include the file down here. And then you would just need to change the width and the height according to your file. Now the file I've got is 48 pixels. So we have 48 divided by four is 12 because that's four pixels per byte, of course. That's what you would need to do. So hopefully you can use this as a starting point for your own little game, maybe. Anyway, that's all I've got to show you today. If you liked what you've seen, please like and subscribe. It helps me with the Google Analytics. Um, you know, they rank videos by how many people like them. So hopefully if you do, other people will find the video. Also, I'm hoping you're gonna join me for the EGA version, which we're gonna be looking at next time. Whatever you do though, I hope you enjoy your programming and you hope you enjoy MS-DOS. Have a lot of fun and good luck with whatever creative projects you're doing. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.